Hey everyone, uh, welcome to Couple of Farm. My name is Mark Catelli. Um, Rebecca Means from the Coastal Plain Institute will be, uh, hey Rebecca, very excited Hi. to have this person. Uh, she's an excellent educator, I can tell already. Um, and uh, I'm very excited about this project because it will have a local impact, hopefully in the near future as well. So welcome everyone. Uh, let's get started with our announcements really quickly. Um, there. So Couple of Fern is a chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society where our mission is always the conservation, preservation, and restoration of native plants and native plant communities. Um, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. So it's youtube.com slash couple of fern. Uh, matter of fact, I have it on a separate tab here. This is what our channel looks like, and we have tons of content from news to programs to garden chats um, to even gardening. So if there is a, a need for you to learn about native plants, please go ahead and click on subscribe in the uh, right-hand corner. It looks like a little red box and says subscribe. So go ahead and subscribe and uh, support us for free. Um, members, please report your monthly volunteer hours in case you are viewing um, this live stream on your laptop or computer or tablet. Uh, pull up your phone and uh, your camera function can be pointed to the QR code and that will route you directly to the volunteer hour form. It should take you, I would say, 30 seconds to complete. And it basically tells FNPS that, yes, we are contributing a lot of volunteer hours. So we highly encourage all our members to report their monthly volunteer hours on a regular basis. And I wanted to plug in some pictures of summer in Florida. Uh, right now is an excellent time to see our uh, summer blooming plants. Uh, so just a few. Uh, this is partridge pea. It is an explosion of flowers right now, Chemia crista fasciculata. It happens to be an excellent nectar and pollen source. Uh, I would say more pollen than nectar uh, for bumblebees. Uh, matter of fact, this particular plant really favors bumblebees. And if pollinated by bumble bumblebees, it's a successful pollination that will yield seeds very quickly. So Chimae crista fasciculata, partridge pea. Another one is coastal plain palafox. Uh, Palafoxia integrifolia. It's an unusual plant. Uh, you don't see this a lot in uh, landscape applications, but it is a uh, short-lived perennial. It is a cedar at this point. Matter of fact, the right-hand picture shows you seeds that are slowly maturing on this plant. And yellow anise is actually in bloom right now, Elysium parviflorum. Uh, the leaves are extremely fragrant. Unfortunately, this is not one of our edible anises. Um, it happens to be a horticultural success story. Uh, this plant is only found in Central Florida, only found in about seven counties in Central Florida. It is endangered in natural lands due to habitat fragmentation and habitat loss. But the horticultural industry has amplified its presence in landscapes. So it happens to be a success story where the plant industry has given this, uh, this species a second chance. And another unusual one, Rattlesnake Master. How many have heard of this one? Uh, Eryngium yuccifolium. It's in bloom and it has these wide globular shaped uh, inflorescences unusual blooms from an uncommon garden plant. This plant is decidedly uh, more wet or mesic uh, soil loving. So it really requires uh, even amounts of moisture throughout the year. It also uh, prefers bright shade uh, and not full sun in case you guys are interested in gardening with this unusual native plant. Rattlesnake Master, it gets its common name because early on people thought it would be a cure for rattlesnake bites, but it's not. Um, but it is a cool plant to see once it's in bloom. And this is us. So we were actually out at Seminole IFAS last Saturday. We were gardening away. 
Uh, our native plant garden now, dem demonstration garden, has 20 species, and it's just a really small sliver of the garden, uh, but it boasts 20 species, and all of them are local or regional to Seminole County, and they're naturally found there. So we're really supporting and amplifying the local, regional, native plant message, as we all should. So please come and join us. And these are our services, in case you guys don't know. Uh, we do a lot of gardening, demonstration gardens, like we just touched on. Um, and then we do education programs like this is education. But if you'd like us to do a presentation with you, you can always contact us. Our email address is right here, coupleoffern at gmail.com. And then we also do consultation. So contact us if you'd like a yard consult uh, for Florida plants. And we'll come out or we can set up a Zoom call, uh, whatever is convenient for you. Come grow with Couple of Fern. This is my modus operandi every single time, right? <laughs> so we have events, workshops, field trips, virtual learning, internships, plant sales. Our next plant sale is in August. We have a small plant sale coming up in July. Uh, we do a lot of community gardening. Uh, we are actually planning a workshop, so please keep an eye out for that. And always, Couple of Fern is known for its virtual learning platform. So please continue to support us through YouTube or even becoming a member. And a Couple of Fern members, you probably are wondering, well, what does it take? Well, if you're in Central or North Orlando's metropolitan area, then that is our direct service region. Uh, we uh, encompass all of Seminole County, all of West Volusia, and all of the North Orlando suburbs that blend into Seminole County. Uh, so please, if this is uh, your regional area, please support Couple of Fern. Or if you happen to be a distance learner, so I'll pull up a map right here. You can see uh, right here in Florida, the North Orlando suburbs, that's the bulk of our membership. But we actually have a few outliers, even one in Pennsylvania that happens to be a distance learner. Uh, and if you happen to be one of those people, then absolutely you can join and support couple of fern uh, we will not stop our uh, social learning experiences even uh, as the uh, pandemic subsides and finally goes away coordinated plant society fnps.org if you go to the website click join and then you can select couple of fern we have student individual household and business level memberships you can always refer a loved one to us this is what the form looks like on fnps.org. And if you scroll down, fill in your core information, here's chapter, and you can select Couple of Fern. It's simple as that. So fnps.org, Couple of Fern. And tonight, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Rebecca Means to you. Uh, she's gonna be talking about Florida's newts and select amphibians. Um, please welcome Rebecca Means. Rebecca, if you would like to introduce yourselves to our fans and our uh, members, that'd be great. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca Means. I am the director of Coastal Plains Institute. We are a very small nonprofit. There's two of us. <laughs> and we are based in the panhandle of Florida. So we're in Wakulla County. Um, but we do work all over Florida and throughout the southeastern coastal plain. Our mission is to preserve the biodiversity of the southeastern coastal plain. And we do that through scientific research. And mostly our work research has to do with ephemeral wetlands and longleaf pine ecology and amphibians. And then we also have a significant environmental education aspect. We own two properties that we are restoring back to native landscapes. One was a slash pine plantation that we are converting back to longleaf pine flatwoods. And then the other is a uh, bog and forested preserve over in Pretty Doe <laughs> Bay. And we actually harbor a state in threatened species, the white top picture plant. So we've got those and we are burning that property next, in the next couple weeks. So um, I am here to talk to y'all about uh, amphibians, ephemeral wetlands, and how we engage the community. You shared my screen, <laughs> right? It's, it's on. Right. 
Yes, it's on. <laughs> <laughs> You're ready to go. <laughs> um, and just so y'all know, I'm not a formal presenter. I, I can see the chat box or the comments. So feel free to ask me any questions as I go. Um, you don't have to sit there and listen to me and then wait till the end to ask questions. So, so uh, to start off with, um, talking about ephemeral wetlands. So just real quick, let's get out of the way of what ephemeral wetlands are. Um, ephemeral wetlands are basi basically wetlands that do not hold water year round. They are isolated, so they're not connected to a river or a water body, and they come in lots of different shapes and sizes and types. They're called various things depending on where you are in the world or in the country. Up north, they often call them vernal pools because those wetlands up north fill up in the spring. That's their rainy season, so that's when they spring. Here in Florida, well, here where I am in Wilcullough County in North Florida, our wetlands, we have our rainy season in the winter and then again in the summer. So our wetlands fill up in the summer and in the winter. Our wetlands right now, we've had a very dry spring. They are completely bone dry. We are starting to get those tropical thunderstorms coming through. So hopefully our wetlands will fill up soon. But this is an example of an ephemeral wetland. This is a marsh, uh, an herbaceous marsh wetland. Here is another picture, another type of ephemeral wetland. It is ephemeral marsh. It's just a larger wetland, different characteristics, different plant species, and an even bigger one. You might see the um, lily pads in that wetland, which denotes that it holds water a little longer than some of the other ones. So, so some wetlands will hold water for a year or two years. Some only hold, hold water for a couple months. So these are all herbaceous marshes. You also have wetlands like cypress domes. Uh, this is an example of a cypress dome. And then you've got some wetlands that are, are mixed. They've got cypress trees or tupelo trees, but then they also have a herbaceous center. But again, the thing with ephemeral wetlands is that they do dry periodically. This is a picture of the same wetland. It is a cypress dome. It is wet in the winter time. This is down in Volusia County near Port Orange, wet in the winter time. And then as spring comes on and you get more intense sunlight, but also you have leaf out, right? All of the plants are starting to get their leaves out and photosynthesis occurring. Then the wetland will dry. Here is a, um, an example, another couple examples of the same wetland in different seasons. So this is Pond 73 <laughs> um, in the wintertime, same wetland in the springtime. You can see the button bushes have leafed out. Uh, and so a lot of the um, water is taken up by the plants. Here is another wetland. This is uh, a very hydrated wetland. This was after one of our hurricanes a couple years ago. Uh, lots of water in the wetland, same wetland, different time of year, completely dry. So from those pictures, you might be able to figure out that even the same wetland can hold water different amounts of time from year to year. So we call it hydro period, and that's just the length of time a wetland holds water. So some years a wetland might hold water for eight months. Another year it might only have, have water for three months at a time. And that really depends on your rainfall, it depends on geology, it depends on um, the vegetation in the wetland. And so one of the really interesting things about ephemeral wetlands is it turns out that it doesn't matter about the size of the wetland in terms of biodiversity, especially relating to uh, amphibian species. So these, this is a picture of three wetlands that I studied using drift fences and funnel traps, um, trying to monitor what amphibians were using these wetlands. And the wetland on top is a acre to larger than an acre wetland. The one on the bottom left, you can see that's just like a, a live oak tree branch that's going over. So it's a very small wetland. And I, 
I documented nine species of amphibians using that, that tiny wetland on the bottom left and 11 using that larger wetland. So the number, the species richness of a wetland doesn't really matter, the size doesn't matter. And that's significant from a conservation standpoint because a lot of our laws, local and federal and state laws, protect wetlands that are greater than an acre or two acres, they don't protect the smaller wetlands. And those smaller wetlands are just as significant in terms of providing habitat for amphibians and other species. So in Florida, we have about 20 or 30 species of amphibians that breed in ephemeral wetlands, about half of which are what we call ephemeral pond obligates. They have to breed in ephemeral wetlands. They can't breed in any other kind of wetland. So, the, so of those 30 species, some of them are generalist. Some of them will breed in lots of different water bodies and are quite familiar to a lot of people because you can find them in urban and suburban areas like the Southern Toad and the southern leopard frog, this is a relative of the pig frog and the bullfrog, we find those breeding in ephemeral wetlands as well. The squirrel tree frog, this is one of those frogs that can be kind of annoying to some people because they hang out on windows and they make a lot of noise when it's raining, but um, we find them in ephemeral wetlands. And then this is the eastern newt, this is another generalist species, it is uh, found throughout eastern North America. We do find them in ephemeral wetlands. And then um, there are species that, again, are ephemeral pond obligates. You will only find them breeding in ephemeral wetlands, like the barking tree frog. This is our largest native tree frog in Florida. We now have the Cuban tree frog, which actually predates on the barking tree frog. But in terms of our native species, this is our largest tree frog. And gopher frog, ephemeral pond obligate, they're only found in ephemeral wetlands. Oak toads, and the striped newt. Now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so my picture gets bigger. There we go. And I will show you this is a striped newt. So it's kind of a small salamander species. It is a, calm down girl. It's a, it's a rare species. Uh, and I'll tell you why this is significant here in a few minutes. But you can see that red stripe perhaps down the side of her body. That's well, a striped newt. Okay, and so the reason that these species depend on ephemeral wetlands is because they dry out. They do not have, they do not have fish in them, and a lot of fish are predators of amphibians, and they don't have large populations of invertebrate predators. So the species that breed in ephemeral wetlands that are ephemeral pond obligates, they have to breed in these fishless, isolated wetlands. So the majority of these species are actually live in the uplands. They spend the, the vast majority of their life in the uplands and they only migrate down to the wetlands to breed. And when they're up in the uplands, they're fossorial, they're living underground. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because it's a lot more humid underground than it is out in the, uh, in the open Florida sun, right? So they'll util utilize gopher tortoise burrows. They will um, hang out in stump holes, under logs, under bark, leaves. And some species like this Eastern Spadefoot that's shown on the right can actually, can actually dig their own burrows. And what we found when I say they live in the uplands around the wetlands through drift fence studies, which is what's pictured on the left, that's like a, that's a fence with funnel traps on either side of the fence, and telemetry studies, so the, the technology has gotten small enough that we're actually able to put 
tracking devices on some of the larger frogs like this gopher frog. Uh, we've documented amphibians more than half a mile from a wetland. So they're not just using a little piece just past the ecotone of the wetland. They're actually traveling quite far into the, into the wetlands. And that's again, significant from an ecological standpoint because they're utilizing both upland and wetland uh, ecosystems. And therefore, if you're looking to conserve these species, you need to look at both types of habitats, right? So in the case of the frogs, they come down to the wetland and call for their mate. Um, and some species will breed in the wintertime and some species will breed in the summertime and some species breed year round. Um, and so I just wanted y'all to know that I know who I'm talking to tonight, the Native Plant Society. So I wanted to emphasize that vegetation does matter. So it matters a whole lot to these amphibians that are living in the uplands. Their upland vegetation matters. They need that herbaceous understory of like longleaf pine forests that are, that are um, fire adapted and are fire dependent. Because if you think about a, a species that's really tiny trying to navigate its way through a thicket, it's very difficult uh, versus having a lot of herbaceous vegetation. So um, that ground cover matters a lot, especially when they're migrating down to their wetland to breed. Once they get to their wetland, the vegetation in the wetland matters a lot as well. And a lot of these ephemeral pond obligates depend on this herbaceous vegetation in the wetland for ovipositioning sites, so places for them to lay their eggs. And then when their eggs hatch, that vegetation provides cover for their larvae. And then in the case of tadpoles, which is not pictured here, this is a salamander larvae, which is a predator, but tadpoles are herbivores and they eat algae that's stuck to the vegetation in the wetlands. So it matters. <laughs> and for you plant nerds out there, here are just some of the species that we find in our ephemeral wetlands that, that tend to be pretty significant in terms of uh, when we're looking and we're, we're um, inventorying wetlands and we're looking at the vegetation, these are the vegetation, uh, these are the species that we see and, and we say, all right, this is a really good wetland. This is providing good habitat for our striped newts or our flatwood salamanders. Okay, no more plants. So when they get down to the wetland, that's where breeding occurs for the vast majority of our amphibians here in Florida. These are ornate chorus frogs, which you do not have down in your area. Um, they're, they're further north of you, but they're beautiful ephemeral pond obligates. And then, of course, the eggs hatch into tadpoles in the case of frogs, and the tadpoles live in the wetland. The amount of time that a, that a tadpole stays in the wetland before it can metamorphose into a frog varies species by species. So some species like this pinewoods tree frog um, takes about two months to metamorphose. And then some other species like the gopher, gopher frog can take six months or more to metamorphose. Um, but it also depends on the resources in the wetland. So if there's a lot of food in the wetland, if there's a lot of water in a the wetland, then the individual can take longer to metamorphose versus if the wetland's starting to dry up and there's not enough food, they'll go ahead and metamorphose quickly and get out of there. And then they, here's a picture of the same species, pinewood tree frogs, that's metamorphosing, right? So now it's sprouted its legs and it's, and it's starting to absorb its tail. And they'll go off into the uplands. And through, through various studies, we've learned that the, most of them are, have site fidelity. So they'll actually return to the wetland that they were born in to breed in subsequent years. There are some that are all like journey people, right? And they go off wandering and they will colonize other nearby wetlands, but a lot of them will return to their native wetland to breed. In the case of newts and uh, the mole salamander and some other species of salamanders, 
things can get a little confusing from a natural history standpoint, life stage standpoint. So this is just a diagram of part of the life cycle of an Eastern newt. You have those down in your area. Um, the eggs hatch into embryos and the larvae live in the water. And then uh, they metamorphose into a terrestrial F. These are the uh, people call them red spotted newts. They call them red Fs. Um, you can see them on the land. They're orange with black spots on them. And then while they're up in the uplands in the next year or so, they will um, grow and become a terrestrial adult. Then they walk back to the wetland when it's time for them to breed. And they kind of metamorphose again. They don't do a huge metamorphose. Um, but they will change their body shape so they have more of a keeled tail and their skin goes from being grainy to being smooth and they're what we call an aquatic adult and so they're doing that in the wetland as they're preparing to breed and then they will breed and the cycle begins again but it's a little more complicated than that because the eastern newt and the striped newt which is pictured here the mole salamander and some other species can actually decide to stay in the wetland and not metamorphose into that terrestrial eft and terrestrial adult stage. So they'll stay in the wetland, we call them pedomorphs, and they become sexually mature individuals, but they retain a lot of their larval characteristics, like the, their external gills, the feathery gills, their keeled tail. So they kind of look like a big larva, but they're actually a sexually mature adult. So a little bit complicated, really fascinating. Um, you, I could do a whole talk on facultative pedomorphism and obligate pedomorphism and you know that all, what's driving that the genetics and the and the environmental cues but we'll move on um so in terms of the biomass that these ephemeral wetlands are supporting there is a huge amount of biomass that occurs so you've got these adults that migrate down to the wetland they breed and you get hundreds and thousands of metamorphic individuals that were born and raised in these wetlands that are then going back into the uplands. This is a picture of a pitfall trap that we have um, at one of our research sites. It's just a two, two and a half gallon bucket. And in one day, we caught over 200 metamorphic oak toads in one of the traps. Um, we also, that day, I think we caught like 1,500 metamorphs leaving the wetland just on one day. So that's a lot of energy that's going from that wetland up into the uplands. And when you think about the food web, while the tadpoles, the salamander larvae are in the wetland, they are prey to lots of, lots of uh, species like turtles and snakes and birds. On the flip side, they, they are important predators in the ecosystems. They eat mosquito larvae. They eat all kinds of invertebrates, small invertebrates in the wetlands. And then when they move up into the uplands, again, the whole food web, they, they are prey to snakes and birds and all kinds of things. And then they too eat. Plants. <laughs> So ephemeral wetlands are very important for plant species as well. Um, we, we see carnivorous plants like the sundew. Um, there are lots of uh, wetland obligate as well as facultative species that can, can live in wetlands but can live kind of in the uplands too and those that are dependent on the wetlands. Might, no, not my last one. So it turns out that there are several species that of amphibians that breed in ephemeral wetlands that are actually declining throughout their range. And if you think about it from, you know, they use wetlands and they use uplands. Well, you, you look at the upland habitat in Florida and that's where everybody lives, right? Like nobody wants to live in a swamp. Everybody's living in the high and dry land. So in the sand hills, for example, this is a map, the dark green is showing what's left of the sand hills in Florida. Uh, we've lost over 80% of our sand hills over the last hundred years. 
and less than half that remain are in conservation or managed lands. So the habitat on the upland side is decreasing and that's impacting other species too, right? There's the red cockaded woodpecker, a federally endangered bird species. Um, gopher tortoises have been in and, in and out of the listed species section uh, over the years. And endangered plants that are wetland um, obligates. This is called the Harper's Beauty. It is a federal endangered species and it is endemic to up here in the Florida Panhandle. I think this is my last plant species picture. So pay attention. This is the last one I got for you. Uh, this is Chapman's crown beard. It is um, endemic to the Apalachicola lowlands and it is a state threatened species that lives in wet prairie habitats. In terms of amphibians, there's there's that upland component that we talked about. And then there's, a, there's quite a lot of other factors that can contribute to their decline. Uh, drought, uh, if those wetlands are not filling up with water, then the amphibians can't breed, right? Or if they fill up with water and they're not holding water, their hydro period is short, such that the larvae don't get a chance to metamorphose, then that obviously becomes a problem in one year. But if that happens year after year after year, then if you have like a shorter lived species that can very, very uh, much contribute to population decline. Uh, groundwater withdrawal, this is a problem that's going on throughout Florida. Um, as cities are, are expanding, we're drinking more water, right? And using more water to water our lawns and drive industry and all that. And that actually depletes the aquifer, which can prevent the wetlands from holding water for as long. Off-road vehicle damage, you know, when these wetlands are dry, they kind of look like mud holes or just like dry areas. And so a lot of people don't even realize that these are actually very significant landscape features that all these species depend on. Um, and so they go mud bogging, right? Disease, amphibian diseases are now um, becoming really widespread. They're moving up from the tropics. Um, and then winter burning, that's like a, a land management issue of not burning in the ecological time. I'm sure y'all are well aware as plant people that um, fires used to are lit by lightning and they used to come along our landscape every few years, burning in the late spring, early summer. Um, from a management standpoint, that can be kind of difficult to burn lots of acres in the summer because it's hot, it's volatile. Um, and so a lot of times managers will burn in the winter time which impacts the plant community, right? So the vegetation again matters, right? And it can really affect the habitat and the species that depend on the various vegetation. So at Coastal Plains Institute for uh, several decades, we have been monitoring the ephemeral wetlands here in the Apalachicola National Forest in this area called the Munson Sandhills. We've been monitoring them using dip net surveys and drift fence surveys. And what we found was this one species, the striped newt, was declining. And from a global perspective, there's there, they have a very restricted range anyway. They're only found in Florida and Georgia. So already you compare it to the eastern newt that's found throughout the eastern North America. Here's this newt that's only found in Florida and Georgia. It's a habitat specialist. It has to breed in ephemeral wetlands. It needs these sand hills and scrub environments. And there just aren't that many breeding wetlands um, left of them. A lot of them have been um, developed and all of that kind of stuff. So what we found here in the National Forest is we were unable to detect the striped newt for 10 years. Um, that's a significant amount of time, right, for a small amphibian not to be able to find them. So we worked with the Forest Service and to come up with a conservation strategy for the striped newt to bring back the self-sustaining population here in the National Forest, because it was, it was a stronghold. It was one of the uh, largest populations of striped newts. So in order to do this, there, we did a couple steps. First, we needed to 
get newts to put into the wetlands, right, to bring back into these wetlands. So we went up to Georgia, which had the only, it was the only known population of the western striped newt. Um, it's not a subspecies, it's, it is, but it is slightly different than the striped newts that y'all have there in the, in the peninsula, like in the Ocala and um, other areas closer to y'all. So we wanted to get like as close genetically to the ones that used to be in the national forest. So we um, got some larvae and we sent it out to some zoos. We, we now have five uh, partners that are raising newts for us, including the Orion Center for Indigo Conservation at the Central Florida Zoo. Uh, they are one of our breeding partners. They're actually coming up in two weeks or maybe it's next week to bring us some of their newts for release. So anyways, we have these partners that are raising the newts for us and we are releasing their the young from that those wild caught individuals. So we're we're not releasing um, captive born for a long, long time or it's just ones that were born directly from um, wild caught individuals. But before we did that, we wanted to make sure that there weren't any diseases. Right. We did. We wanted to address some of these issues that could have caused the decline. So we did not see have any evidence of like mega diseases. We looked for chytrid, we looked for ronavirus, and we didn't have any evidence that that was, that was a problem. And then we didn't want to put newts in a wetland and have the wetland go dry. So we actually did this crazy thing where we got these bulldozers when the wetlands were dry. We did this to three wetlands. We dug up like a foot and a half of the dry wetland basin and put that sod and vegetation up on the uplands. We laid down a synthetic rubber liner that was 40 feet by 40 feet. And then we kind of piecemealed everything back. And this picture in the bottom right shows three months after we did this. So the wetland just came back so quickly. Uh, we were very thrilled with, <laughs> with how uh, well this worked. Um, then we put drift fences around these wetlands and buried bucket traps on either side of the fences all the way around the fences and the idea between behind those is that we can document if an amphibian is coming down to the wetland to breed it'll go left or it'll go right and it'll fall in one of our buckets so then we come out and check the buckets every day so we can measure who's moving in who's moving out and in 2013 we began releasing these newts that were born in captivity at our partners uh, facilities and um, this has been quite a work in progress um, because there's like this balance of the of the zoos producing enough newts and the wetlands having enough water in the same year which is really hard to do apparently so some years we'll have a whole lot of water in the wetlands and then the zoos population they're not just not breeding and then some years they'll give us a whole lot and we've got no water in our wetlands like like right now um, we have over 400 lar larval newts coming and all three of our wetlands that we're monitoring with drift fences are dry so uh, we have a backup wetland that has water Anyways, after eight years, uh, we've released over 3,000 adults and larvae, and we've had some successes. We've documented um, quite a few of them leaving the wetland that we had repatriated them into. Uh, we've detected some returning in subsequent years, which is like what you really want to see, right? Coming back to that wetland to breed. And then we've also been able to document that captive born newts put into a wetland will breed. <laughs> so that was a big deal, right? And that their young will survive. So we've had some successes. Um, we are looking forward to seeing more this year. Uh, but when we do these releases, and this kind of speaks to what I was talking about, how we do scientific research, but environmental education is a really big part of what we do, as well as engaging the community in what we're doing. So we have like a big release party. This was taken in 2019. 
Um, so before we all had masks on while we were doing this, um, but we invite all of our zoo partners to um, spend several days. We mark the newts, we release the newts, so that they can meet each other and get a get a really good conversations going on about how they're raising newts and what's working, what's not, um, but also get to see that field component too. So they're not just like, oh, we're raising newts and we're shipping them off somewhere. They really get to understand the 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 whole process. And then we invite our, our members, we invite the media um, so that we can really get a lot of people involved in this conservation effort. It's not just us doing it and talking to other scientists about it. And to that end, we have several uh, environmental education programs that we do. Um, one is a, I'm gonna speak about two of these. One is what lives in the wetland, one is adopt an ephemeral wetland because these may be relevant to you in the future. Um, we also have a wetland club where we work with a local teen center that has adopted a wetland and we meet them out at the wetland regularly to dip net their wetland and see what's in there, but also just to hike around and uh, learn about, about the environment around there. And then we have what we call a striped newt repatriation team. If you remember, I said that we check those drift fence traps every day from January to July, and there's two of us. So that's like over 280 days of everyday field work. So we train people to check the drift fences, right? So we have quite a few volunteers that um, we've trained to, to do this as well. So our What Lives in the Wetland program is basically a field trip where we hike people through the longleaf pine ecosystem and talk about fire ecology and um, red cockaded woodpeckers and we also like eat blueberries and smilax and then we get to our research site it's about like a three quarter mile hike in and we talk about the striped newt we talk about the research we're doing we train them to check our drift fences and they go around and learn about scientific data collection um, and about what's living in the wetland right and it's not just amphibians that we capture in the drift fences we catch little baby turtles like this little mud turtle we catch um, eastern glass lizards, all kinds of different reptiles. And the invertebrates are really fascinating too. Um, we get some really cool tiger beetles and scorpions. So th those drift fences allow people to really see what's living in and around the wetlands. And then we have another component where we dip a near, nearby wetland. We use a dip net, so teaching them about sampling methodology. And then they get to see what's in the wetlands. They get to see tadpoles, tadpoles that are metamorphosing into frogs. And then they also get to see a lot of other things like the invertebrates that are living in the wetlands. And the dragonflies, they are, <laughs> the dragonfly larvae are such ferocious predators of amphibians. So you learn really quickly not to put them in the same bucket as your tadpoles. And we do these programs for school groups, summer camps. And what's really amazing about this, and I'm sure y'all, any of y'all that have done education is um, the change that you see in people that after just like an hour or two of being outside, because a lot of people are just not comfortable being outside, right? Or um, they're afraid of, usually it's snakes. If it's not snakes, it's spiders. Um, but then after being out there for a while, you realize that nothing's going to get you and um, people become a lot more comfortable. So that's been a really neat um, aspect of this. But we don't just do this for school groups and kids. We do it for adults as well. This is the Southern Fire Exchange. It's a group of land, private landowners. And the reason I'm telling you this is because y'all could have a field trip up here. Um, there's some really fascinating uh, biodiversity hotspots here, um, endemic species, uh, plant species that are in the Apalachicola lowlands. So you can make a whole trip of it and come up and see our Strike New Project and um, go see some endemic uh, Apalachicola species as plant species as well. 
And then, um, so our adopt an ephemeral wetland, I'm bringing this up because Mark alluded to this earlier. Um, we may, we may, I may help y'all um, sample one of your your wetlands down there that you're you're inventorying for plants and butterflies, um, and that's based off of this program that I started here in the Apalachicola National Forest that we call Adopt an Ephemeral Wetland, and it is a citizen science project that engages the citizens to collect data for us, basically, right, on the amphibian populations, and y'all down there you are in the range of the striped newt. So um, it would be very interesting, and not to say that, that's, that they're gonna be found in that wetland, but you never know until you sample, right? So um, these, this is just a picture, just in case y'all go before I um, give you a training. <laughs> Keep your eye out if you see these newts. These are larval newts. The one on the top is a striped newt. This is that rare species. It's actually um, going to be, it's in the process of being listed as threatened in the state of Florida. Um, it has a bunch of spots on its tail. Why the striped newt has spots on its tail, go figure. Um, but it's got those black spots and then it has these bigger feathery gills than the Eastern newt, which is shown here below, which is quite kind of plain looking. So, if you see um, something that looks like this, a newt larvae with feathery gills, and it's got black spots, you might have striped newts. So at our trainings, I call them dip netting days, and we host them once a month. And I train people in how to dip net appropriately, like how to use your net, how, where to dip net. And this is something for, for all ages. That's my mom there on the left. She's turning 80 this year and she can still dip net. Um, and so we teach them about how to do that and then also teach them about amphibian ID. And so we host these monthly so that people can, the participants in our program can come back um, in different seasons. And so they can refresh if it's been a year since they've been out dip netting in the winter, um, but also as the seasons change, they can learn the different species that they might be seeing in their wetland. I also found that um, for a lot of people, they are not comfortable necessarily going out in the middle of the national forest by themselves. <laughs> um, this took me a couple of years to figure out, but um, so now I hold, I hold these every month and I'm like, okay, I'm out here. I'm going to be at this wetland. Stop by, say hi, go dip net your wetland. Um, but I'm out here. And I think that makes a lot of people feel better. And then they get adoption papers. So I have 50 wetlands on the adoption list and I, there are a variety of sizes and accessibilities. So um, they fill out a form and I, I pick their adopted wetland and they get this adoption packet. And on my end, I get valuable data, right? I've got, I've got hundreds of people that are out there dip netting wetlands, collecting data. Uh, and then on their end, they're learning amphibian ID, they're learning local ecology, they're learning public land issues, and being able to get outside and just enjoy being outside. And I've found that there's a lot of people that want to go outside. They want to bring their kids outside, but they don't necessarily feel confident. Like, well, what am I going to do? And I don't know stuff out here. So like, what am, what am I going to do? But this gives them a reason to go, a place to go, training, um, materials. And so people have really, um, this has really resonated with a lot of people down here. Um, but I, I'm looking forward to expanding the program to other parts of Florida. And so um, we're going to kind of play around with a little Zoom training and things like that to see if we can um, get something going for y'all down there in Central Florida. Um, we've engaged over 2,600 citizens. It's probably a little higher now because I had a field trip earlier this month. Um, 
oh, since 2013. So we've been we've been doing the Adopt a Wetland program since 2013 in our field trips, and uh, we've been able to really engage a lot of citizens. Some just like a one-time field trip, so I just see them for three hours, and then I never see them again. And then some are repeated, like that teen club that comes back regularly or people that are adopting a wetland, I tend to see them several times a year. So um, I, that's all I had, um, but I'm happy to take your questions. This is just where to find us. And if you're interested, like if you come up to this area um, relatively frequently or once or twice a year, you could consider adopting a wetland or um, I, I can offer you field trips to our strike new project and we also are doing vegetation surveys of our wetlands so um, can always use some some plant knowledgeable people to help us with our um, characterization of our wetlands oh my gosh such an amazing amazing presentation folks if you i mean you didn't see me in the background but i was like clapping away <laughs> laughing it was just everything you're such an excellent educator i just want to uh, that, rebecca i was I, yeah what a pleasure what a treat so i wish uh, i had seen you clapping because i thought i was talking to myself <laughs> <laughs> so somebody wrote thank you rebecca for a first class presentation <laughs> amen amen folks if you have questions now is the time to post and comment them uh, we can pick them up just like you saw the uh, compliment that somebody wrote for rebecca and uh, pose that question uh, before this webinar concludes. I already have some some already written down. Imagine that. So okay. <laughs> let's let's kind of tackle a few. And um, I wanted to ask you about frosted newts. So I hear a lot about frosted newts, but they're very rare. Um, they're not found down here. They're a panhandle species. Um, can you speak a little bit about this uh, rare, I, I believe it's an endangered amphibian at this point? Yeah, so newts are salamanders. Um, and not all, all newts are salamanders, but not all salamanders are newts. So what you're speaking of is the, is the frosted flatwood salamander, gotcha. yes. And um, they are actually related to the mole salamander, which you do not have down there either. You have no embistomatids where you are in, in, the, in the peninsula. But um, yes, so it is, it used to be one species called the flatwood salamanders. And um, in 2009 or 10, because of DNA analyses, they split it into the reticulated flatwood salamander and the frosted flatwood salamander. One's on one side of the Apalachicola River, one's on the other. Uh, they are both federally endangered species and they are extremely rare. They are dependent on ephemeral wetlands to breed. And one of the big problems with them has to do with the burning regime. So I spoke about winter burning kind of and how it impacts the vegetation in the uplands. Um, it favors woody vegetation instead of the herbaceous vegetation. But there's also uh, ephemeral wetlands need to burn as well, not just the uplands, but the actual wetland basin. And if you don't burn in the spring and early summer when the wetlands are dry, then you can't, the wet, the fire won't run through the wetland. So um, we actually, I mentioned early on that Coastal Plains Institute has property, um, that, that slash pine plantation that we're restoring to longleaf pine is in the range of the flatwood salamander. And we have a wetland that we just burned last week, actually, um, that we're trying to restore uh, so that we can get flatwood salamanders in there um, by removing woody vegetation in the wetlands so that all that herbaceous vegetation can can flourish. Um, but yeah, they, they both both uh, species are extremely rare. Um, in the Apalachicola National Forest, there's a few uh, wetlands. I, I could show you, they, they do this thing called head starting now where um, they're, they're having a hard time breeding them in captivity. So whereas the striped newt, they're able to um, 
the, the individuals are breeding and they're laying eggs and their eggs are hatching into larvae. Apparently they're very difficult to breed in captivity. So what they're doing, and we helped um, a, a colleague of ours with FWC do this back in December, they're going out when the flatwood salamander will have laid their eggs, her eggs, and crawling around on the floor with a flashlight and picking up the eggs and carrying them back to a facility to um, hatch in a more confined environment and raise the larvae up yeah. to a certain age um, so they're better able to survive because the eggs Great. can only hang out for so long before they dry out. Wow, wow. All you wanted to know. <laughs> yeah, like for our viewers, can you make the distinction between uh, what what constitutes a salamander and what constitutes in a more refined way a newt? What is the defining characteristic? Yeah, so they're just, um, it's just a taxonomical, you know, there's, there is class amphibia and inside amphibia in the United States anyway, we have um, anura, anurans, which are the frogs. And then we have the caudata, which are the salamanders. And then inside salamanders, you've got all these different families of salamanders. And so the newts are just one of those. They're just, they're just, you know, they're, 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 just one of those taxonomical differences. So it's kind of like with frogs, you've got the bullfrogs and the pig frogs, you've got toads, you've got um, tree frogs, they're just different types of frogs. So a newt is just a different type of salamander. They do have that, that um, terrestrial phase of them with that drier skin. So you could almost compare them to toads because you know how toads have that drier skin to them and they're a little better able to right. um, live in upland environments mm -hmm. above ground so newts um their terrestrial adult stage are they have that kind of grainy skin a little drier skin ah, good to know good to know you got mm -hmm. a fan mail again sylvia thomas right <laughs> valuable information <laughs> vast knowledge thank you mm -hmm. um I wanted to ask you, so Eastern newts are very common here in Central Florida, as you mentioned, and we are just on the very like border or limit of the striped newt population. Um, with e Eastern newts, because they're so common and more people will be able to spot them, the probabilities are higher. Um, where do we look for them? Um, and like, is there a particular time of the day? Like, is it better to go out during dawn or dusk? try to see them when they're more active or a particular time of the year. What do you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So the Eastern newt is, um, I mentioned before, it's a habitat generalist. So you can find it in lots of different habitats. We uh, find them in our ephemeral wetlands. They are also in our spring fed rivers and they are in you know, larger ponds. Um, so they, they can be found in lots of different habitats. If you're using a dip net, you could go out during the day to see them. Here, um, if some of y'all have heard of Wakulla Springs, we have, I mean, I'm sorry, the, we have Wakulla Springs too. We don't see them there, but in the Wasissa River, which is a little bit east of me here, um, there's a huge spring and it's called um, Big Blue. <laughs> there are blue springs all over Florida. This one's called Big Blue. And you can uh, canoe or kayak to the spring head and look down in the water and see tons of newts. They're like all over the place. They'll come up and breathe air, but um, they are they are everywhere. So that's just during the day. You can look down. Um, I think they're kind of locally abundant. So in those types of places, you can just go and look. Um, you can use a dip net to dip net up for them. Um, I think you know you see them in in like forested environments on land, like that terrestrial F stage, that red spotted stage. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're pretty relatively easy to um, encounter. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, with our frogs, we, we probably have a lot of frog admirers uh, wa watching and we'll watch this mm -hmm. later on too. Um, I'm not a good 
frog spotter, but frogs like the barking <laughs> tree frog, for example. Um, it, do you recommend going like late in the evening or overnight, uh, putting on a record, a recording machine out there and trying to hear for a certain frog calls? How do we, um, because we're a couple of fern is engaging in an amphibian study program, how do we properly demonstrate, um, you know, or um, record each species? What would you recommend? How would we start on that? Okay, so with frogs, there's two things you could do. One is, again, you can dip net and find their tadpoles. And so you learn to identify the tadpole species. And that's really useful because you can document that they actually bred there. So hearing frog calls means that they were present, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they bred or that they successfully bred in that area. Um, but so that's one thing, and you can do that any time of day, um, any time of year. There are, um, you know, I'll have to look into that. I think where y'all are down um, in the panhandle, the, the seasons tend to be a little loose, right? So up, up here where we are, we, um, we do have species that breed in the winter time. Gotcha. And then we have like our tree frogs only breed in the spring and summer. Gotcha. Um, but I think for y'all, you could go year round and see many different species. Awesome. But one of, one of the really fun things to do, especially going out and doing it as a group, is to go out at night and list, just go up to a pond and listen for frog calls. Absolutely. There are some great resources on the internet about um, that you can like click on a button and hear the different species of, of frogs, but you can also like, you get your little headlamp on and you can track them around and you right. can go listening to the calls and you can see them and ID them that way too. That's awesome. Okay, your fan mail is rolling in. Jen Mangos writes, that was truly amazing. Thank you so much. I agree, second that or third that at this point. Um, Eric actually has a question for you. Uh, great presentation. He would like to know more about your educational programs with Coastal Plains Institute, and if there's any major difference between eastern newts and the subspecies that is found in the panhandle. Yeah, okay, great. So um, our educational programs, we do a lot um, of in situ learning things. So we offer field trips, we do, um, we do walks out at our property. So we just had, um, especially during the pandemic, that was one of the things that we found that we could do safely and help people get out and actually see other people, but do it in a safe environment. So we hold um, nature walks uh, quite regularly. And um, another thing that we started during the pandemic, and I'm going to continue as long as I keep getting these grants to continue it, uh, is something called Meet the Scientist. And what I've done is I've created videos for, this is for um, school aged kids, um, but I could do a, one for adults, right? Um, but they're, they're aligned to educational standards. And so um, one of the ones that I did had to do with the water cycle. And so I made this video of being out in the field and talking about the water cycle and ephemeral wetlands. And then I, I Zoom or Skype or whatever into the classroom and do kind of a Q&A with the students. And that has been really, it's so much fun for me too, because I'm getting all these questions that have nothing to do with what I know, right? So I was like, I don't know what the most dangerous I don't know, snake in the world is, you know, all of those things. But um, so that's been a really, really fun uh, program that we do too. That's more of like a virtual program. And in terms of the newt, so um, the Eastern newt is the overall species, Notopithalmus viridescens, but there are subspecies. So we call ours the Yours is the peninsula newt, ours is the Florida newt. There, there's lots of different um, subspecies and they're, it's, they're just a little genetically different. Um, not enough to be called subspecies. And if the two, if our newt met your newt down there, they would breed. So they are not um, different species, but there's some really interesting things like um, 
what they found down in the peninsula is that if there is an eastern or peninsula newt breeding in a wetland, you won't find striped newts in that wetland. So they're kind of, there's some kind of competitive exclusion thing going on there. But up here, we see both species in our wetlands. So Very this is kind of interesting, yeah. That's great anecdotal information. Um, <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Eric, for your question. Rita writes, you're very passionate about what you do. So yes, we agree. And uh, Matsi writes, Tracy writes, this is our intern for the semester. She's been wonderful. It's a complete delight. Oh, great. So she's joining us and she says, thank you very much for a fascinating and lighting presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question regarding plants and, and this is just, I know you're not a specialist on native plants, but just through direct observation and in your experience, I noticed some of the native plants that you mentioned in your presentation, like Eleocris, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, you know the uh, Zyrus species, uh, etc. Those are all herbaceous species, and of course, decidedly wetland. Uh, but what makes these particular plants favorably interact with amphibians, and particularly? Yeah, native I think I think part of it is their um, their growing style, right? So you know how there's some plants like sawgrass that can form like a really dense thicket. And I mean, we do see Eleocris sometimes pretty in pretty thick mats, but I think that um, I didn't put any, We so this, this gal here is, um, her name is Surfer. She is the most famous striped nude in all the world. She's our, uh, educational specimen. So we bring her to festivals and things like that. We keep, we have road grass in her aquaria. She's a terrestrial, I mean, she's an aquatic adult. So she's got that really slick skin and keeled tail. She still breathes through lungs, but, um, and she can like swim all through that um, road grass and, and it provides good cover, but it's not such a thicket. Um, so I think that that is part of it. And, you know, just having that diversity of different types of vegetation can be really important. Um, but definitely Eleocris is like, is one of those uh, species that if we see it, we're like, oh, that's good. That's oh, good. that's awesome. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah, it's very soft. People uh, take off their shoes and sandals and they just walk barefoot over it. Uh, yeah. You know, railroad sedge down here. It's a super soft plant. I assume that newts, because they're so uh, even more fragile than us, they probably prefer plants that are soft and forgiving rather than anything woody yeah. or abrasive. Um, yeah, and the woody vegetation um, tends to shade out the herbaceous vegetation. And right. so that's why uh, we talk about getting fire in the wetland, but things like button right. bush, are yes. really important um, as long as they're not like all in the wetland but we a, a lot of our wetlands have multiple button bushes growing around it they provide you can you can stalk the button bushes and find barking tree frogs in them in the in the springtime the adults so they'll perch up in the button bushes and then they'll plop down at night to breed very cool mm -hmm. very cool good to know um, and then, you know, if we embark on this amphibian study uh, project, uh, of course, we'll have to somehow implement pitfall traps. Um, but we need to look at um, drift fences, right? For pitfall traps, they, they're sit, like you have to have a drift fence in order to have a pitfall trap. Well, um, so you really dip netting uh, is a great... To, you know, Dip netting is a really good um, monitoring technique because you can go out and do it like kind of on a one, we're going to go out today and do this. Then we'll go back in a month or two and do it again. Um, when it comes to drift fences, you have to check those fences every day. So it's it's very labor intensive um, to because you have to install the fencing then you have to have the traps and go out every day. And then when, you, when you're when you done, say you just wanna do it for four or five days, then you gotta pull that stuff up. 
Um, so at, at least in the beginning, I would recommend just starting off dip netting and seeing how it goes and the interest level. But if you do want to embark on something, the drift fences are very helpful because a pitfall trap is kind of a needle in a haystack, right? Like you're just sticking your trap in and hoping something comes by, but a drift fence provides a blockage. And so then they'll have to go one way or another. You can use funnel traps um, instead of pitfall traps. Um, there, I've done studies both ways. You just have to make sure that you provide cover and moisture so that any species that gets captured can um, survive. survive. Oh, right. <laughs> it, I love those pitfall traps because you you not only get uh, you know your target species or cousins of your target species, but you also trap their predators. So yeah. so it's, so it's like yeah. a goodie bag in there. Uh, you know, the next morning you're like, wow. <laughs> The yeah, place really, the, the place is really active at night. So I, lo I love those things. Um, that's all I had, um, you know, and I think uh, everybody is enjoying the presentation. Um, one last question from Alicia oh. Fowler. Uh, she writes, are there any books that identify the frogs and salamanders in Central Florida? Yeah, that's great. So um, <laughs> this is what we call the Bible. <laughs> This is like, this is like a, I mean, it's a, it's a dense, heavy, this is not exactly like a fun field guide, um, but it has information about all the amphibians and reptiles in Florida. Um, there, is, there are a couple options. So this, this is one of my favorite that we actually give out as prizes to our volunteers, you know, like the people that dip netted their wetland the most. Um, this is the frogs and toads of the Southeast. And then there's another one um, that are the salamanders. And I'll just show you like, it's very like lovely. You've got the range map, you've got pictures, you've got kind of, I'm doing this backwards. <laughs> yeah. And you've got like little quick, did you know, interesting facts. It's not, it's very like approachable for regular people. Yes, <laughs> yes. Alicia, I so, see your yeah, I see your username, Alicia. You got kids in your picture, so this is a book that will be suitable for them, for sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, guys, that kind of wraps things up. Thank you so much for joining the delightful Rebecca Means from Coastal Plains <laughs> Institute. Um, we look forward to uh, engaging in amphibian studies here at Couple of Fern. And... Uh, yeah, we'll see you. We'll see you soon, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Yes, sounds good. Bye, Mark. Bye. Bye, everyone out there. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Bye.